And so I'm going to talk about our deployments. And so last year I did a similar talk, which was OAuth deployments, and now we're doing the Verizon Media deployments. So we have three different types of deployments that we do. We have our typical office deployments, so you know employees, VPNs. We have our back office deployments. That's your you know your SAP or you know whatever databases that you might have running, hopefully in a data center, but probably some of them are you know, in some closet somewhere. And then we have our production traffic, which is where we're watching uh, the traffic that's going to in front of our data centers that our customers are using. Our design is that we have all of our tools on one box instead of using specialized boxes for each tool. And then each location might have a number of boxes. And so the tools that we use include Bro, Seracot, and Moloch, obviously. And then we have some other stuff that we run on there also. But everything is on one box, or all the tools are on one box, and there may be multiple boxes per site, depending on how many or how much traffic there is. But we don't have specialized boxes. We use MPBs or network packet brokers to load balance the traffic in the sites. Even in offices, we use an MPB where you might have just one visibility box mainly because there's actually multiple switches that might be sending traffic, and just to keep our deployment uh, consistent everywhere. For some of the sites, we have to reduce the traffic. So the biggest traffic reduction, reduction that we do is with TLS, where we only capture the first 20 packets. After the first 20 packets, we don't save the data to the disk. We only save the metadata, because there's really nothing useful in the encrypted data. Another problem is in offices, especially, is security cameras. Security cameras seem to generate a lot of traffic, and you really don't need to save that to disk. And so again, we have ways, you might do it with VLANs, you might do it by identifying the traffic or the IPs, but we only save the first few packets with um, the security cameras also. That way we can, we save some of it just in case there's someone attacking the cameras. So you don't want to just totally get rid of the camera traffic, but there's no reason to save all of the traffic going to the cameras. So this is a nice high-level design that was done not by me, and Josh did it, um, which is trying to show like how all the traffic is flowing through the system that we have. The important line is the big thick line there, which I, th I think is green. I'm colorblind, uh, which is trying to show that the, the black traffic from the cloud goes through some kind of network device, eventually hits a tap, an optical tap or a span port or something, hits your network packet broker, and your network packet broker is going to send it off to the various places it needs to go. And the office sites, it's usually just one or two visibility boxes. In a production site, you're going to have a lot of visibility boxes, and you might even have some flow boxes if you're doing flow. And in our back office sites, it's smaller. The other thing that we're showing here is that we have a shared deployment for Elasticsearch for our offices. That's the top or mid right right here. And then we also have this utility shared area, where we have a bunch of shared things across all of our clusters, not just their office clusters. So this is shared ac across everything. And what's in there is mainly like our UI. So that's the endpoint that the user hits. And also our Y servers are in this utility shared area. And please, if you have questions, let me know. Oops. So like I mentioned, we have these utility boxes. We consider those our most secure boxes. We have both network ACLs and IP tables, just to be double sure that uh, they're protected. They're going to have load balancers in front of them. We have Ys on there. We use Redis with the Sentinel, um, I don't know what you call it, protocol to, to handle the, the caching for Ys. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And that's where our UI lives. We use Apache with a, as our reverse proxy. We have a module that does our authentication in the Apache, so our, our Moloch UI is only used is only used for um, authorization. The authentication is done by the Apache. We also have a shared Elasticsearch cluster for just the users database. So we have many Elasticsearch clusters, many Moloch clusters that share their users database. That's a feature that I don't know if everybody knows about. That you don't have to have different users per cluster. You can have a configuration that allows you to have one system that's used for all of your users. We also have our database of 
um, Seracot and SQLs and SIGs that are stored on there that are pulled down to the various sensors. Another thing that we use for that we use the utility boxes for is to sync our shortcuts. So that was the new feature that Elise talked about earlier. And here's just some examples that we have where the utility boxes are constantly going off to Splunk and to some configuration files. And they suck down configuration for shortcuts and upload it into all the different Moloch clusters. So here's some ones that, you know, some sample ones. You might create an RFC 1918 shortcut that now anywhere on Moloch, you could say dollar RFC 1918 and it will match these IPs, and you don't have to remember them, they're just there. And if you have, let's say, your VPN subnets in Splunk as, or whatever system, as a uh, lookup table, you can suck it down, upload it into Moloch, and now inside of Moloch, you can say IP equals dollar VPN subnets, and it will just return traffic that matched your VPN subnets. And then the last example here is someone just created a shortcut called evil IPs, just, just on that cluster, and that one isn't something that we think that's, you can create shortcuts yourself. So at Verizon Media, we're big fans of uh, network packet brokers, NPVs. I talk about this a lot, and so I'm sorry if you've heard this before, but this is the one thing we recommend to folks who are just starting out with Moloch or just network security in general. Get a network packet broker. It will make your life easier in the long run. We're big fans of Aristas, mainly because they're cheap and they're easy to use and you might already have them. So there are, um, there's more advanced network packet brokers that have a lot more powerful features, but they're usually specialized hardware where many Arista switches can just have configuration set and they instantly become a network packet broker. So you might already have one that you can start with to play with. The Arista version is gonna do um, very, uh, simple things with load balancing and, and other operations, where the more advanced ones, the specialized hardware have packet deduplication and other features. So it really depends on what your use case, uh, which one you might wanna use, but that's just what we use. And basically all we're doing is load balancing the traffic and some simple rules to reduce our traffic. So traffic is gonna flow in on one side and load balanced on the other side. That's the way we like to think about it. One of the most important reasons to use a network packet broker is it really reduces friction between you and your network team, the security team and the network team. And I guess we have some network folks this year. The network team, you know, they want to support and add new capacity whenever they want. And the security team wants to make sure they're monitoring that traffic. And if you have to coordinate, sometimes that can be difficult to make it happen as fast as you want. What a network packet broker allows you to do is you stick it in the middle, and as long as you have enough open ports, the network team can install new links whenever they want, and the security team can install new tools or new Molochs or whatever, whenever they want. So it makes the, the interaction a lot more palatable and easier, so we really like them. The other big advantage to having a, a network packet broker instead of having taps that feed directly into your tools is if you're in a large, location where you might have two network stacks and you have some kind of uh, asynch asynchronous routing or failover, HA failover or something like that, a network packet broker is gonna make the traffic flow to the correct tool server no matter which path the traffic takes. So definitely if you're in doing some kind of large deployment, you, you have to have one. And if you're doing a smaller deployment, it, we strongly recommend it, but and I'll get, I'll have some more diagrams in a minute that explains it a little bit better. So our visibility hosts, like I said, we're running everything on the same host. We use AF packet. It makes things a lot easier. Zeek is a big memory CPU hog, so you have to make sure that you scale to support it. And then you just wanna make sure that you have enough capacity in the future if you wanna run other tools. What we do is we do two RU boxes there's not as many of uh, those out there, but they work great for space, especially when you're dealing with um, offices where there might not be enough room in the IDF room for huge uh, 4RU or even bigger boxes. And we haven't gotten many complaints against them, other than sometimes they're a little bit deeper, so they don't always fit into the, the cabinets that are in the, um, oh, what do I need to hit? 
Let's skip. <laughs> it says AOL. What's that? If I hit skip, Rich, is it going to be OK? <laughs> OK. Uh, TRU, uh, the other thing that sometimes is scary with the TRU boxes is the fans are pretty powerful. And we've had some offices where they can hear them through the wall and they complain. But other than that, uh, it's OK. So what have we done for hardware? Because of the two RUs, we're basically limited to three different um, configurations, at least in our experience. There's super micros, Dells, and HPs. In the past, we've used uh, super micros, which is the one on the top right. We're switching to Dells, which is the one on the, the bottom right. The big difference between the designs is in order to hit those middle disks, you have to actually pull out the machine and unscrew some stuff, and then they pop up where the one, the Dell and the HP is very similar to the Dell. You actually can slide out the disks, and it's kind of like a transformer or something. I don't know. It's neat. And those other ones flip down. It doesn't really matter. Um, what we do is we use 10 terabyte drives for our offices, and everything else is using 24 ter 12 terabyte drives these days. For our Elastic Search boxes, which we call our Moloch ES boxes, we actually use reuse gear. We don't go out and buy new boxes for those. Most of them are around five years old. We do put new drives into them, and they've worked pretty good. And we run with replication of one. So basically, that means we have two copies of everything. Everybody always asks about how much do these visibility boxes cost. These numbers are semi-made up. and This isn't what we pay, but this is what you can kind of budget for. Usually, your disks are going to be your most expensive part of whatever you're building. You can go to Amazon, and you can instantly price how much a 12 terabyte drive is. Right now, 12 terabyte drives are pretty much the sweet, bo sweet spot for building visibility boxes. You can get up to 16 these days, but then you're, you're going to pay a premium. Um, and then the 10s and, and 8s, you're actually starting to pay a premium for those, too. So the 12 is where it's at. And so you can instantly price out. That's kind of like you're not going to get any deals there, usually, with the drives. Where you will get the deals is with the box. You can fool around with your CPU. Generally, people say add six to $7,000 to the cost of your drive, and that's how much the box is going to cost. So you could probably go build one for around 19000 maybe even less. Or you can go with a brand name, which is instantly going to add 5000 just because they have a brand name, and they're going to want to charge you another 4000 for support. But for under 30000 you could get a 240-terabyte box that easily can run all of this stuff. And you can actually do it for a lot cheaper. If, if you're a bigger company, you have decent discounts with somebody, or do it yourself. So for example, if you, go, if you ever follow Backblaze and their 45 drives thing, you can buy this equivalent box for, uh, I want to say it was 12000 But I know companies can't always do deals. So what does our deployment look like for offices? So we have actually two, in every office, there's going to be um, two what we call uh, USWs, but they're basically switches that are handling the traffic. And they run an HA pair. And so we have two SPAN ports running off of those to our MPB. And our MPB is then forwarding it off to our visibility box. And the visibility box is talking to an Elasticsearch that's centralized. So every office, like including this office here, has visibility boxes. But then the Elasticsearch that it talks to is centralized in a data center. And it's sending all the meta metadata there. So the PCAP, for those who aren't familiar, the PCAP lives in the visibility boxes, and the metadata lives in the Elasticsearch boxes. For production, it's a little bit more complicated. We use Ixia optical taps. The optical taps are you know, between a router and the internet. One of the things to always remember when you're scaling and, and uh, preparing for optical taps is for every link that you're tapping, you actually need two links on your NPB. So you have to multiply by two when you're doing your port counts. And that's because the optical tap is seeing both the transmit in both directions and sends them out as two different links to the NPB. Then the NPB is going to load balance it to all of our visibility boxes. We have many visibility boxes per data center, and the Elasticsearch cluster lives with the visibility boxes in the data center. 
What does that look like in reality for an MPB? Well, it's just a switch. We haven't seen one in real life. They're not that exciting. They're just all lit up. Some of the things to work to watch out for is, is like hardware reliability, especially with Elasticsearch. If you don't have very reliable hardware, you definitely want to up your replication count and do at least one, maybe two with Elasticsearch. So that's going to take more hardware to store everything. You need to configure multiple endpoints so that you have uh, you can support failover when a, one of the Elasticsearch nodes fails. There's some special configuration you need to watch out for with Elasticsearch 6 and 7. There's all kinds of web pages about it, and we, we have some stuff up there. And definitely use security with, IP, uh, with Elasticsearch. If you're using the open source version, you either need to use IP tables or you need to use one of the third-party plugins that does authentication. You can now use for free, but not open source, Elasticsearch authentication also and um, encryption. So you just need to choose what you're going to do. So some of the things to watch out for once you get Moloch running is one of the things is your write tasks being rejected. So on the stats page, we now have this write tasks rejected and write tasks just handled per second columns. In this example here, we can see this box 17 has way more write tasks being rejected. And this is kind of hidden from you if you don't go and look at this, that this is actually happening. What the write task rejected means is that Elasticsearch has dropped the write, the insert, and just happens silently. And if you see one node that's having problems, that, that node is it's probably having a RAID issue or a hardware issue or something else is failing. Another thing that you may or may not want to do is don't name your boxes sizzles. It turns out that's, that stood for sizzle Elasticsearch. And we had heat problems with our boxes that we named that. So <laughs> it came true. <laughs> it knew. The other issue with Elasticsearch is too many shards. This has actually gotten worse with Elasticsearch 7, surprisingly. Elasticsearch 7 dislikes having too many shards even more. And so you can quickly look on the stats page how many shards you have per index. And with uh, Moloch 2.1.0 that's coming out soon, we made it a lot easier to, to fix this, but all of the versions prior will show it to you. And, and in this case, these last two nodes have 24 shards, but only 300 gigabytes per uh, index. And you want to keep your shard, the size per shard around between 50 and 150 gigs. It depends who you talk to and how fast your disks are and whatever. But in this case, even if we use the smallest, which is 50 gigs per shard, at 300 gigs, we, at most, we should have six shards. Or because, of, because it's replication, at most, we really should only have three shards. Um, and so 24 shards is, is way too many. So wh whoever set this up, me, should have used a much smaller number than 24 shards per index. And so you can go back through now and do the shrink command, and it will reduce the number of uh, shards. And that's something that we heavily recommend, and it makes Elasticsearch a lot happier. So if, if you haven't looked at your cluster, that indexes page, this is something you should do. So how do we size our clusters? For offices, we do, basically do it based on the number of employees. And for production, we do it based on how much we're trying to store. The reason we do it based on the number of employees is because our office location is it's kind of hard to know what's going to happen. There's no real average data bytes per second there, but we do know how many people are there, and we know roughly what our average employee you know, does. And just this example spreadsheet is kind of an eye chart. You can go back and look at the presentation later, but what we do for every deployment is we put together a spreadsheet with what the average traffic rate is going to look like, how many links there are, and then we do calculations based on a bunch of different variables of how many hosts we'll need. And we do hosts required based on two things. One is storage, and one is gigabits per second. So we know how much a visibility host can store. So in this spreadsheet, we use 230 terabytes usable. And then we, we know how much a host can process. And in this spreadsheet, we used four gigabits per second. And so it will produce these two different numbers. And then you can use them to figure out which uh, and then it does a max, and it'll calculate which is the number of hosts that you need per site. 
And same going for costing. We do this. We put together a spreadsheet with the number of links, how much each link costs, how much each uh, visibility box costs, how much NPB chassis versus line card. We can easily calculate how much we're going to spend. And in reality, this is about how much we spend percentage-wise. We spent the most on our visibility boxes uh, in production, which should be obvious because our production is doing hundreds of gigabits per second or more, where offices are doing much smaller amount of traffic. How do we reduce traffic so we don't store it all? We have two main ways. We have our MVB is dropping traffic based on IP and port. If you buy some of the more advanced MPBs, they can actually do it based on protocol. You can say, I don't want these certain protocols. But because we're using the Arista, we're limited to IP and port. And we generate long lists of ACLs based on a Perl script from our CMDB, where we know there's certain uh, hosts or types of traffic that we don't want to uh, capture or even look at at all. And so we can generate our ACLs to load into our MPB so that we don't see that traffic. And then on Moloch itself, we can use rules to drop traffic, and then also we use a bunch of other configuration. So it's kind of hard to read, but this, this top part is what like the input to our script might look like. This is saying from this file that we have called mail.yahoo.com, we don't want to record any SMTP traffic. And it's going to go through, look at all our CMDB and anything with that name, it's going to instantly say, oh, we're not going to save. We're going to generate ACLs so that we don't get any of the SMTP traffic. And this is what the ACLs might look like that it's loaded into. Oh, ACLs stands for Access Control List. And then here's some sample rules. This is the most basic. This is on our, on our web page. And we'll start including it with our samples. But basically, this is saying for any protocol that's TLS, only save 20 packets. Because you don't really need more than 20 packets for TLS, because you just want to see the signature, uh, the handshake. And this way, you can generate the, the JAW3 signature and other things. Another good one for production depends where you have your MBB and your optical taps. Ours happen to be before any kind of firewalls or ACLs or stuff, so we see every single SIN scan which is pretty much useless because uh, people are always sin scanning things. And so in this case, it's very specific where if the sin scan was unsuccessful, so that means there's a sin and no response back, we're going to drop it. There's no reason to save it from our point of view. If you're a network analyst and you want to like watch uh, sin scans, that would be you might not need this, but want this. But from our point of view, a SIN scan where there's no reply, we're going to drop. If there's a SIN scan where there is a reply, so that means they got through something and there's some kind of reply back, then we're going to save it. Even if that reply back was only one packet, we're still going to save it just so that we know, hey, this made it to our host and our host replied back. We want to save that in case we want to look at that later for whatever reason. And then there's more advanced rules. So in this case, if um, you happen to have a lot of servers or clients that are talking to things in the cloud, you may want to drop the traffic based on the IP address that comes back from IP lookups. So it's hard to say that right. But for example, add that double click might live on the cloud, have lots of IPs behind it that are shifting constantly because it lives on the cloud. And so what this is saying is we want to if someone is going to add that double click, we want to drop all traffic to that site based on the IP that came back. And only if it's TLS. If someone goes to add that double click and it's not TLS, then we'll um, still save it. We have a, on the web page, we go over some of the high performance settings. A lot of people start out with Moloch and get it working and then throw it onto a network that's like a 30 gigabit per second network and say it doesn't work. Uh, you do need to do a little bit of tuning once you go past maybe three or four gigabits a second. So please just look at these on the web page. But the most important thing is the packet threads. What a lot of people do is they'll go in and go, oh, packet threads, I'm just going to set that to 100 because I have 100 cores and I have this awesome machine. What actually happens is because of how um, threads are scheduled and a bunch of things. 
you actually make it a huge number, it will make performance worse if you don't need it. So really, packet threads, the one thing I always tell people, start with about 1.5 times the gigabits per second as a, and see if that's enough. It almost always is. Don't go start with 24 or the max. It's actually going to make your performance worse. Recently, we've started uh, playing with hot warm config for Elasticsearch. And the, the sizzles boxes are the hot boxes. And the other boxes are the normal boxes. And these, um, we actually have client nodes too. If, you're, if you haven't done Elasticsearch before, uh, one of the recommendations is, is you have kind of your warm boxes, which are your steady st stream boxes that are doing the storage for uh, long term. You might have these client boxes, which is what Moloch itself talks to. So it doesn't talk to the boxes that are actually doing the indexing. It has these separate boxes. And then if you have a lot of data that you're indexing, you might have these hot boxes that are on SSDs. And so we start using that in uh, a few of our most heavily trafficked networks with some success. Uh, we're, still, we're still tuning it. And I know there's some of you out there that are doing it, but it definitely is helping. So if you're having, if you're having some uh, issues with keeping up, you might look at the hot, oh, here's where I put it, the hot uh, warm config. And yeah, and naming your boxes sizzles is tempting. So last year, I mentioned this in passing, and everybody goes, what? So I thought I'd stick a slide in this year about PCAP and encryption at rest. Uh, you should be doing it. If you're not, you should. There's basically two general ways you can do this. You can use disk encryption, which is just fine. And you can do Moloch encryption, which is just fine. And I put together some comparisons between the two. The main difference, in my point of view, is that with Moloch encryption, you can't use your normal tools directly on the files that Capture is running, writing out. You actually have to use the tools on what Moloch Viewer um, exports to you. So if you want to go to a capture machine and just be able to look at the capture, the raw capture files, can't use Moloch encryption because those files are now encrypted. They're not in standard PCAP form anymore. You would have to use disk encryption for that. The reverse is if you're afraid, which I am, that people are getting on the box with just disk encryption, if you get on the box, the, the file is still readable, right? Um, and so plus and minuses. There's also the boot issue, you know, with Moloch encryption, you don't have a boot issue, but there is uh, a CAC that's stored in the config file, which some people don't like. Or you could use a TPM. I mean, it's just, it's, it's half dozen, right? You choose which one you want, but choose one of them. And basically, how does Moloch encryption work? It's a little bit complicated to explain, but there's basically a data encryption key for every single file that's unique. So every file that's written to disk has a unique data encryption key. That, with a bunch of other stuff, is stored encrypted in Elasticsearch, and it's encrypted using the key encryption key. And that key encryption key is stored in the configuration file of Moloch. And so what that does mean is that if someone does get access to your box, you know, even though with Moloch encryption, they can't directly uh, read the files, if they're smart enough, they could figure out how to go to Elasticsearch and get all the pieces and actually still decrypt the data. But it's not foolproof. I mean, nothing is foolproof. Questions? Uh, you mentioned uh, one and a half uh, uh, threads per gigabit per second. Right. Is that based on some characteristic of like the, the PCIe bus, the transfer disease? No, it's just uh, me randomly picking a number. So it's, w it's what I've seen. Uh, so I have not done the scientific study. We, we've been looking at this uh, high performance tuning for Suricata, and we've been playing around with, with that tuning. Um, and we've been, we've been able to push Suricata to 30 gigabit per second on a single host. 
uh, provided that we buy a whole bunch of Xeon cores. <laughs> but one of the issues that we've had has to do with um, uh, getting the data off the card in the first place and how many channels do we have to be able to do that. Uh, so I was wondering if you were running into that same sort of issue and uh, maybe that was the reason for the, the recommendation. No, so we personally have never pushed it that high. There is a company that I don't want to name names, they might be here, who has done that with Moloch where they've gotten over 20, I want to say it was even higher than that, but they weren't writing it all to disk because that's usually the, bo the bottleneck with Moloch is just writing all that data to disk. I mean, you, your, your rate cards and other things are usually either going to be at six or 12 gigabits per second uh, without spending a bunch of money that's kind of where you're going to start hitting issues anyway. So getting up to that 30 writing to disk is uh, that's a challenge. Right. Okay. What's the value add that you get from running Zeek in addition to Moloch? Like on the same box, or just a general philosophical question? Uh, just in general. I mean, I've looked at it a number of times, but I always go back to, I've already got Moloch here, so what's the, the extra that Zeke brings to the table? <laughs> that is an excellent question. So for those who don't know me, I'm Jeff Atkinson. I've been with the Z community for since like 1.7 or 0.7 actually. So it's been a long time, but a lot of what I've been able to do with Zeek outside of Moloch is the flexibility of scripting and getting data out that we can log more, basically just more telemetry uh, is the big thing. Example is JAW3, another example is looking for uh, the boundaries um, of, of content types, you can drill down into the actual header values and extract things. So there's a lot of telemetry you can pull out to, to log or to alert on. Thanks, Jeff. There you go. So I want to ask about the uh, drop-in packets uh, on the encrypted sessions after 20 packets or so. Uh, I want to I want to um, know at what level do you drop them to make it as more, you know better performance as possible, and would that performance increase if you actually ask the packet broker to shunt them after 20 packets? Uh, great question. So currently, it's done early inside of the pipeline of Moloch, but it still makes it off of the network card into Moloch, and Moloch is going to process them. Uh, shunting, like the new uh, Napatech and other cards can do now, is something we've started to look at, but we've never played with it. The one issue with that is then you're going to start losing your packet counts and packet size. So if you're ever using that, then the shunting isn't as useful. Uh, because then it depends what you want, right? Shunting it, if you're if you're doing like, if you're trying to get to the 20 and 30 gigabits per second, the shunting is definitely going to allow you to get there much quicker. Um, but if you're not, then it hasn't. We haven't noticed it hit performance. Um, so basically, what you're saying is, although you're dropping those packets, you're not storing them. You're still in, uh, incorporating them in in making a session. Yep, it's still counted as part of the metadata. Got it. Thank you. Great, well thank you very much. Nice.